Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. And welcome back to Solo RPG Friday. Okay, today on the episode, we are going to be taking a look at the new RPG from Alex T and Black Oath Entertainment, and that is Sacrifice, an incense and iron RPG. On the episode today, we will be doing a quick comparison between the print-on-demand versions from Amazon and the deluxe version from LFOSR. And LFOSR is not a company that sells LFOs, or I guess they could be if they added a US at the end, they could be LFOs are us, but no, they're a company that sells kind of handmade deluxe versions of independently produced RPGs. We're going to do a quick overview of the game system. We will take a detailed look at the character creation because I think that's where a lot of the uh, special qualities of this game exist. Then we'll be taking a look at the travel and world and bestiaries within the, uh, within the core game. And we will also be taking a more of a detailed look at the expansion, the companion, the sacrifice companion, and the sacrifice chronicles. So on the right here, we have the print-on-demand version from Amazon. I have heard that the print-on-demand version from DriveThruRPG is a little higher quality, but I wanted to get these here quickly for a video, and Amazon just ships quicker than, uh, than, than DriveThruRPG does. When you do print-on-demand stuff from DriveThru, it can take a little while to get to your house. So I went with Amazon, and I wanted these just for my kind of like play and reading and throwing around copies. And for that, I think they are perfectly fine. This copy here is the deluxe version from LFOSR. And yes, it does come with a stick of incense. I actually broke my stick of incense a little bit. I don't really burn incense in my room anymore, uh, but this does add a nice little smell to the books and to, your, uh, to your, the components that you're going to get in the deluxe version. So let's take a look at the deluxe version real quick. All of the gameplay things included in the deluxe version are actually included in the companion. So you're not going to miss out on anything if you don't get the deluxe version. So that is nice. So in the deluxe version, you're going to get this nice uh, bound book. One of the complaints I have about this book is the binding is really, really tight. It is a very hard to splay open, and I found it a little difficult to use in any kind of play. And so that is one of the reasons why I opted to get a print-on-demand version, just so I can really open that up and also have a copy that I can take notes in and, and underline and scribble in and that. I wanted to keep this as kind of my nice collector's copy. As a book collector, there are certain things that I buy for collections and certain things I buy for utility. And I think that is perfectly okay for people to do. But this book is very nice. It is very well constructed. It has a textured cover. So high, high quality version here. You also get a little pamphlet that comes with a commoner. So the commoner is kind of a class, uh, sacrifices a classless system, but your characters start at level three. If you want to start at a level zero or a level one character, a real squishy kind of peasant type character, then you can play your commoner and this pamphlet has everything you need to create your commoner and start a game uh, really at a big disadvantage. You will also get a couple little bookmarks that you can use. You will also get in the deluxe version, the GM list rules and tools. And this is a little pamphlet that has all of your oracles and things for playing sacrifice as a solo RPG. But once again, all of these rules are also included in the companion. Then finally, you will get a couple little pamphlets here. You will get some small printed character sheets, double-sided, and you will also get a cool double-sided map of the main continent of the world of Nea, as well as a zoomed in look at the no man's land. And this is kind of like the main area where the game is going to be taking place. So sacrifice, for the rest of the review, we're going to be looking at the print on demand things. Sacrifice is a pretty typical, as far as rule system goes, it is a D20 system that is 100% compatible with any of your kind of OSR uh, retro clone stuff. Your character is very, uh, 
it will be very familiar to people who have played any kind of retro clone or even D&D 5e. It is a D20 system, which means you're going to be rolling your D20 and you are going to be adding bonuses to the total, trying to hit certain numbers to do certain things. For attribute tests, you will be rolling 3d6 and you will be wanting to roll low underneath your under your attribute. So you have pretty typical attributes, strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, charisma, and constitution. Then you have stuff like passive perception, initiative, a healing rate, and a mastery die. We'll kind of go over some of these, some of the, the details that, that make sacrifice stand out as we as we look through the book. You also have a luck system, which is kind of a currency. You have typical saving throws, you have weapons, you have different proficiencies and skills. Your skills will take the bonus of your attributes and you have things like acrobatics, nature, religion, uh, heretical knowledge, insight, survival, and things like that. On the back of the uh, character sheet here, you will have your items and certain items will take encumbering slots and you can hold a certain number of those. So it uses a slot system instead of a weight system. If I'm going to deal with encumbrance in a game, I would rather deal with it like this rather than keeping track of weight. Additionally, this also uses a usage die system for, for things like ammo or oil, thing, uh, uh, piles of torches, things that have a bunch, things that have a quantity. You will be using a usage die system, and that goes from D12 to D4, uh, similar to Fallen. The Fallen RPG is the first time I was introduced to the usage die. I'm not sure if it was uh, made up for Fallen or if that has been in use for some time, but I do enjoy that system. Basically, you start with a D12. Let's say you have D12 ammo, and uh, at the end of a battle that you've used your ammo, you will roll your D12. If you roll a certain number, usually like a one or a two, then it, it drops down to the next uh, lowest value to a d10 then finally you roll that again and you get down to a d4 in which at point you could run out of that quantity and every time you buy a certain quantity of those items then your usage die goes up i enjoy that system quite a bit because i do not like keeping track of ammo and and the number of torches and liters of oil and that kind of thing it's just it's a really nice gamey system that takes away some bookkeeping, but still keeps the interesting things about bookkeeping. Okay, so now let's take a little bit of a detailed look at sacrifice. So sacrifice, you were betrayed, marked for death, marked for sacrifice, I should say, branded, but they didn't count on your determination and will to live, or perhaps it was just pure rage. That terrible night when your world was turned upside down, you discovered who you really are, regardless of the reason or how you survived. But now you are being hunted. Terrible creatures, demons, and spirits of the dead torment your nights. And the Inquisition, the very same institution you once swore to dedicate your life to, has branded you as a heretic, a demon fiend. You travel alone because you know that wherever you go, death will follow. But you march on perhaps seeking revenge or to make the world a bit less dark. One thing is clear. Anyone in your way, be it a demonic apostle or the Holy See, will soon learn how strong your will to live is. Sacrifice comes highly recommended to fans of things like Berserk or things like Dark Souls or Demon Souls. It has that kind of vibe. It is your character against the world. Your character is powerful. It has a very strong sword and sorcery vibe in that your character can do superhuman things. Your character is a, is a hardened warrior, a hardened survivor. You are not playing a squishy little funnel character like you would be at the beginning of a DCC RPG session. So it uses a typical D20 rule set compatible with all other retro clones. It has a classless character creation system with skills, feats, and really cool abilities, uh, combat maneuvers, and that kind of stuff. Um, as a branded, your character is above average, capable of dealing with many opponents at once and surviving what would be certain death for others. So that's what makes Sacrifice ideal for one-on-one -on -one play with a GM and one player or as a solo game. And that's what pushes Sacrifice closer to something like Scarlet Heroes. It has interesting and rich combat. I agree with that, especially when you add some of the stuff from the companion. 
and it has a feudal, human-centric, ruthless world with no magic, but full of demonic evil and corrupted institutions. Okay, I like that Sacrifice doesn't have magic. I rarely play magic users in games, and I often feel like a lot of uh, a, a huge portion of many role-playing books are devoted to magic and magic systems. And because I don't play those, I often have to skip. You know, I, I find that a large portion of my RPG books are just uninteresting to me. You know, uh, like a quarter of the DCC RPG book is dedicated to to spells and magic, and I just have to skip that. So I like a system that doesn't have magic because I don't have to waste my pages in my book that I paid for on something that I'm rarely going to use. But that's just a, a personal thing to me. It has detailed travel and hex-based exploration rules. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm a little disappointed in the hex-based exploration for this. And, uh, of course, No Man's Land setting strongly influenced by Kentaro Mira's Berserk, complete with gear list, bestiary, and gazetteer. All right, so let's dive into this. I have some notes scribbled in uh, this book. So there we have the basics. Again, it's a D20 system with you're going to be uh, looking at difficulty classes from easy, which is a target number of five to nearly impossible, which is a target value of 30. It has an advantage and disadvantage system. If you are proficient in a skill, then you will get advantage when you do a skill check. And for advantage, you roll D20 and you take the highest. For disadvantage, you roll D20 and you take the lowest. It also has some pretty cool critical failure and success tables. I love critical failures in games. I think critical failures add a lot of story. They add a lot of oppor opportunities to do cool role playing. So your characters, uh, the characters in Sacrifice are interesting because they start at level three. You start as a seasoned warrior and there are no character classes. Instead, you start by choosing three feats from all of the available ones. This allows you to customize your character's starting gameplay style. You also pick two weapon and one armor proficiencies and a combat maneuver. As a branded, that's your character, you start the game at level three. This reflects your character's years of experience before their current or ordeal. It also has a bunch of charts for rolling up things like quirks and in your basic backstory and scars and that kind of thing. And then you also will start with 100 silver pieces to outfit your character. The ability scores are pretty typical. You will be rolling uh, 3d6 and you will have your basic uh, modifiers from a negative 3 to a positive 3. Again, you have your basic uh, attributes, strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma. Here's where things start to get a little more interesting. So as a seasoned warrior, you're branded at the beginning when you pick your character you get to pick one of the following titanic strength lightning reflexes unbreakable will boundless vitality and each one of those will add plus two to a certain attribute going down the line either plus two strength dexterity wisdom or constitution so right off the bat your character is stronger than a normal person Additionally, you have been branded by this magical uh, brand and that is very similar to the dark sign in Dark Souls or the Hunter's Mark or the brand of Sacrifice in Berserk. And this brand will alert you to the presence of demonic forces. And conversely, it also alerts them to you. So this is a really cool kind of a narrative system, but also a mechanical system that encourages conflict. And I do enjoy that. These three key elements to your character are something that I really enjoy because it pushes this game really into the realms of sword and sorcery and heroic fiction, the kind of sword, the kind of fantasy fiction that I enjoy. In those stories like Conan and Elric, Fawford and Grey Mouser, uh, Carrick or uh, Red Sonia or uh, Blood Song, you know, those characters, they can do superhuman things. They can fight tons of enemies and come away unscathed. They, these stories are not exciting because of and protagonist death. They are exciting because the protagonists continue to live on and continue to have great adventures. So that is one thing that I do enjoy about Scarlet Heroes. And with these three items here, I'm not done, luck and mastery die. Uh, those three things push sacrifice into the realms of uh, Scarlet Heroes and sword and sorcery and heroic fiction. So I'm Not Done gives you a chance to come back 
after you've hit zero HP. Luck is a currency that you get based on your level that you can spend to uh, automatically pass a saving throw. And a mastery die is a D4 die that you roll that automatically deals damage to certain kinds of enemies. And here we have our, up, our uh, experience level and our system here for gaining experience. You will go from levels 1 to 12 in this game. And each level you gain a certain number of feats and skill points or proficiencies in skills and perhaps more combat maneuvers. Your skills are very typical to D&D. As a new character, you can increase three different skills by, by one. So you have all of your all of your basic skills there and then your feats. This is where things become a little more interesting. You start with three feats and some of these feats are super cool. So I was looking at this, trying to kind of make a character that I would like to play in a Dark Souls game. And I like to play with light armor and a huge two handed F off weapon so I can roll a lot and I'm agile, but I also hit like a tank. And for that, you could choose Colossus Colossal Wilder. Which, uh, let's see, choose a two-handed weapon. You carry an enormous version of it that deals plus two damage and ignores two points of AC. You must have a strength of 16 plus. Talk to your GM to learn how you found such a weapon. So that's where you could use your Berserk Guts Sword there. Uh, maybe you also have a signature weapon that allows you to add more damage. Uh, you can become vigorous where you get more uh, hit points. Or another important one here is Iron Willed. And this says that the dead cannot take control over your body. One mechanism in this game that is interesting is that all humans are constantly under the threat of being possessed by evil spirits. And your PC can become possessed and lose track of time and go off on a killing rampage or have terrible, do terrible things while they are possessed. So if you take that Iron Willed feat, uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty powerful. I'm kind of surprised that that is available at for a level three character. Another thing that makes this game stand out are the combat maneuvers. So when you enter combat, you are going to roll a D8 and you are going to add your character's level to that roll. And that is going to be the number of stamina points that you have to spend on your combat maneuvers in that combat. So every new combat, you replenish stamina. And then you can do things like combat awareness, combat thief, protect, point blank shot, a whirlwind strike. You have a whole bunch of different things that you can do by spending that stamina. And another super cool system about character creation is the weapon marked by darkness. Your character's signature weapon can actually level up in the game and become more powerful and actually learn new abilities with that weapon. And we will be taking a closer look at that system in the companion because it is greatly M expanded on. In the core game, it's very simple. You just get a plus one uh, for every 100 fragments of, it, of an enemy that, that, you, that that weapon collects. But the companion expands that system into something very cool. And then finally here, we have some finishing touches so you can uh, roll up a character flaw such as gluttony, cowardice, greed. Uh, why did you join the Inquisition? Uh, they seemed to live a good life. What became your greatest achievement as an Inquisitor, perhaps participating in the great burning of 320 uh, AI? Who betrayed you? A, a loved one. Well, why is the Inquisition hunting you? You bear a demonic brand that proves your diabolical allegiances. Okay, then we hit, get uh, into that brand system. And where, where is the brand placed on your body? Uh, perhaps it is on your neck. The brand never heals. And when it detects the presence of evil, it actually does uh, damage to you before you, you have to kind of have to overcome that, that, that brand, that, that pain that is constantly kind of haunting your life. And then if you get possessed, then you can roll a D6 to see what happens when your character was possessed. You ran. You have no idea where you are now, so you can get lost. And then you can have wounds and scars. Uh, you can have uh, scars on part of your body. The companion, again, expands the wounds and scars system. And here we have our, our gear. The weapons, the core weapons are, are categorized into bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Some weapons are finesse weapons. Those you get to use your dexterity bonus instead of your strength bonus. 
And then some weapons are versatile, and that allows you to uh, two-hand a one-handed weapon to do more damage. And if you so, if you took a spear, and, and normally it does d6 piercing damage, but if you were to uh, hold that with two hands, try with both hands, uh, <laughs> Dark Souls fans, uh, then you can upgrade that damage to a d8. So that is something that is super cool as well. And here we have all of our other uh, basic ranged weapons, our ammunition, helmets, armor. Uh, shields and other gear that you might need to go out adventuring. And then we move into the core rule system. Again, it is a typical D20 system. You roll a D20, you add a bonus and you try to hit certain target numbers. You have certain saving throws for humans, for beasts and for demons. Uh, combat is pretty typical. You do roll initiative at the top of each round. So that is a little different than, than most games. And when you are in combat, you can do a number of things. You can do a standard attack. You can use a combat maneuver. You can use a feat. You can defend. You can disengage. Or you can do something other. There are also expanded combat charts in the companion, which, make combat, which makes combat even more interesting. And then you also have critical hits, depending on the kind of uh, weapon you have. So if you have a bludgeoning weapon, you have a critical hit chart. Uh, bombs or spell-like effects, you have a critical hit chart, slashing and piercing. Then you also have a fumble chart for a critical miss. There's also a morale system where the enemies can run from you at a certain point. I usually end up in games ignoring morale systems, usually because I just forget to employ them. But I think it's important to Keep that in mind in this game because of the theme, because you are going up against, you know, these uh, a lot of soldiers on battlefields and, and people who are downtrodden, people who are crestfallen, uh, to use a Dark Souls term. You have healing and death rules here. And so your character will use, depending on their max HP, they will have a certain uh, healing rate that they will take when they take uh, when they when they rest for a certain period of time. There's also an injury chart and a permanent wound chart. So even though your character is hard to kill, they will still get permanent uh, permanent wounds that will make them weaker and will make the uh, make their struggle to survive a little um, more strenuous. And then you also have a fatigue system. So if you don't drink enough water or eat enough food, then you can start taking points of, of fatigue. Then we get into the travel procedure. So each day is broken up into three eight hour chunks. During each eight hour period, you can do uh, one of the following. You can set up camp, you can explore a hex, you can forage for, for uh, supplies, you can hunt or fish, you can interact and you can travel. Traveling is where I have a little bit of an issue in this game because there isn't a chart anywhere that I can find. Maybe I'm overlooking it, but I just can't find it. There isn't a chart about rolling up what hex you're entering next you know is it a forest is it a swamp is it a plains a desert there's nothing like that that i can find so you are going to have to bring that tool into the game from somewhere else maybe utilizing a hex flower system or maybe using the overland uh, solo rules from scarlet heroes because there are definitely things where they call out forests or they call out swamps in, in this book, but I couldn't find the chart that you actually roll on to see what your hex is. As you zoom into the no man's land, the, um, the main kind of area of the game, there are details for hexes in this area, but they aren't forests and swamps. They're a little unique, and we'll take a look at that later. So just know that you might need to bring in some exploration rules to play this as a solo game. There are also no rules about any kind of dungeon or ruin or temple exploration. So any kind of in, um, interior exploration systems that you want to use, you will also have to bring in external tools to handle, to handle that kind of thing. But as you explore, you will have to do orientation checks and survival checks. You can have uh, traveling mishaps. You can have different kinds of encounters, no events, or you can find things. You can have uh, events, various events there. You can encounter creatures or NPCs. And you have a chart here for your initial disposition of the NPCs that you encounter. There's also a system of corruption. This is a very evil world. Either you are, your characters are constantly under threat of, of, of evil corruption. 
And as you take points of corruption, you will have to roll on certain things and your character will change. I kind of like in the Fable video game, you might grow horns or you are ice cold to the touch. You do not scar. You look 20 years older than you actually are. And these are cool character development things that can happen that can actually also lead to some cool role playing moments. And then we get a little uh, bit of rules about gaining experience. And then we get into uh, kind of Alex T's forte. His, his specialty is creating interesting worlds. And the world that he has created for Sacrifice is interesting. It's not quite as in-depth as something like uh, Disciples of Bone and Shadow, but it gives you just enough to set the stage and to create some interesting adventures. You have a D20 system for rolling for road encounters, and then it, it dials down into, it zooms into some of the various kingdoms, such as the Kingdom of Pavaria, and it gives you a few places of interest that you could set an adventure in. We have here a random table to roll up a, a band of mercenaries. Uh, there is no band of the hawk here. Uh, but then we get into our no man's land. And this is kind of where your game is going to be taking place, predominantly taking place in. And here we do have a hex type. But like I said, it's not forest. It's not swamps. It's not desert. It's active battlefield, a war-torn hex, a wilderness, or a civilization. And each one of those has additional charts that you can roll on to see what you have discovered if you're in a battlefield, if you're in a war-torn encounter. So this world is also kind of like a black company. There's just kind of war and death and just bad things happening all over the place. And your character is kind of constantly stumbling upon, you know, the the remnants of battle, uh, dead bodies littered throughout the, the world and that kind of stuff. We have also here, we have our encounters for when you're in a war-torn hex for your combat encounters, your combat encounters in a wilderness hex there. Uh, if you come across a band of soldiers, what are they doing? And here we have our NPC motivations and our NPC descriptor charts. I think this would be really cool to combine with the mission generation system from Disciples of Bone and Shadow from the same uh, designer. I wish this had a mission design, a mission system incorporated within its pages. One cool thing are these weekly events. These are things that you can roll up that are happening behind the scenes. They may not necessarily impact your character directly, but they could lead to some interesting adventures. So these different factions are maybe working together or working against each other. They are working in the background to accomplish certain things. We have natural events. We have a general events that are happening throughout the world. Maybe some character events there and also a D20 adventure seed table for you to get going on. And then we have a small section on treasure and rewards. So you could say, you know, what does the commoner have? What does the priest have? What does a nobleman have? What does a fighter have? And a, uh, a rarity here for common, scarce, and rare items. And you also have a D10 chart of magical artifacts that you can find. And finally, like all of Alex T's games, there is an extensive and interesting bestiary. And so you can populate your games with cool monsters and cool fighting encounters. So that is the base game. I do recommend getting the companion along with it because the companion is really what you need for solo play and it expands all of the interesting elements from the game. There was just, there was so much to include in this game that they just couldn't fit the number of pages in the base book. And so they released a companion right along with it. But the companion will give you the uh, occupation of the commoner, that pamphlet that we looked at from the collector's edition. And you will also get, so you can roll up your commoner, you also get another occupation called a knight errant. And a knight errant is an idealist at its core. They believe in honor and the duty of the strong to protect the weak. And as such, they abandon their homeland in search of adventures. So the knight errant is kind of a questing knight that is part of a house and they go out and do chivalrous things for the people of the land. And here we have our weapon forged in darkness. And this is the upgraded system for your weapon leveling up. Your weapons can go from level one to level five. 
And as they progress through the levels, they will get pluses to their attack and damage rolls, and they will also get new traits. And there are 20 different traits that your weapons can get, and they can become things like Death's Mantle or a Fire Shield, a Fluid Stance, a Mind Fortress, a Knight's Eyes, Shatter, Sustenance, Unbreakable. So all kinds of interesting things, interesting things for your weapon to learn as your weapon levels up. I love that system. We also have here a system for detailed starting wounds. So if you want your character to, man, that guy looks straight up like um, Artorius of the Abyss there, huh? That stance there with his like shattered arm and giant sword. But uh, yeah, so you could have detailed starting wounds that will have impact on how your character plays. We also have new leveling options and you can level up faster. So if you want to play a more condensed version of the game. And here we have our, our new combat options. So there are complex duels. So these could be used for, for boss fights. So if you want to kind of simulate a boss fight from a Dark Souls game, this is the system that you would want to use. And I think it would make boss fights a lot more interesting. You have various hit locations for more interesting outcomes in combat. And then you also have some new feats and some new combat maneuvers. And then you will also have your oracles and things for GMless rules. So if you want to play co-op or uh, solo. And then finally, we're going to take a really quick look at the Chronicles. The Chronicles is a, is a series of adventures. These are not really dedicated to solo play. These are more GM led play. But we have here, we have... Um, the False Teeth, written and illustrated by Imad Otala. The Forlorn Forest, written and illustrated by Perplexing Ruins. And then Three Unfolding Scenarios by Alex T. The Unfolding Scenarios are kind of like advanced weekly events that we looked at in the core book. And these are things that are happening in the background that maybe your characters can go off and discover as, as they are progressing. The Forlorn Forest has a bunch of charts that are good to roll on for solo play. But again, this book is not so much dedicated on solo play, and I find it the least useful part of this collection. But yeah, so that was a detailed look at Sacrifice. Again, I do recommend just picking up the base book and the companion. If you don't want to spend the money on the collector's edition, you can pick these up from print on demand from Amazon or from drive-thru RPG, or you can pick up the really nice collector's edition from LFOSR. And when you buy the collector's edition, you also get access to the PDF. So you could easily print up a copy for your play copy. And at that point, you can also print out a map and you could print out more character sheets and you could print out your charts that you might need. So always having access to a PDF is always a really good thing. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at Sacrifice. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye.